Hello and welcome to our sixth episode of In the Trenches with Inventors brought to you by US Inventor. Each week we'll be hearing real life stories from inventors about how and why their patents were invalidated. I'm Natasha Ruckel, your moderator. Our webcast will be about 60 minutes today and we have yet again some unimaginable stories to share with you from our incredible panelists. Then we'll talk a little bit about how you can make a difference today that may help inventors for many years to come. Now we highly encourage you to use the chat feature that's located at the bottom of your Zoom window so that you can actually have a live dialogue throughout the webcast with our panelists. And if we get time, we'll definitely try and answer some of your questions at the end. So don't hesitate to post them into the Q&A button that's also located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now I'd like to introduce your host today. He is the president of the US Inventor Organization. Randy Landrenau is an inventor with three patents. He's a former president and current board member of the Tampa Bay Inventors Council and president of complete product design, a firm that does CAD design, prototyping and short runs. Now at US Inventor, Randy works day in and day out with inventors across America. I don't know how he fits in his day job, but with all his efforts, he enables an amazing grassroots effort to restore the rights of inventors in America. So welcome, Randy. What's the role of you as inventor? And can you tell us a little bit about today's goal, please? So just a little background. I, I Years ago, uh, gosh, 2010, 2011, I was in my garage working on inventions. And like most of us inventors, you know, we're we just work on our stuff. And we, we think uh, if we if we do something important and get a patent, um, we'll have a legal system and you know, the American patent system behind us to fight off infringers. And what I found one day was that, wait a minute, there are multinational corporations working overtime, uh, trying to get laws passed to make it harder and harder to stop them from infringing our patents. And uh, I, I was shocked at this, I was outraged at it. And when in 2011, uh, the American Vents Act, which we'll talk more about during this webcast, uh, was was going through. I was one of the guys fighting it, but you know what? We didn't have we didn't have a real voice in Washington D.C. The voices in D.C. are the huge corporations that do all the lobbying and have all the money, and of course they're on the wrong side on not just this issue, but most of them. Um, and there was a small contingent of, of people who were pro patent. Uh, typically, they were connected with large corporations that that have patents, and uh, they certainly weren't speaking for the little guy, the inventor in a garage and we're the people who the patent system was actually made for. Um, so anyway, um, you know, I fought that one, we lost that one, but when another bill came out in 2013 that was perhaps even possibly even worse called the Innovation Act, I jumped into gear, found another inventor like myself, a guy named Paul Morinville, who actually became the founder of US Inventor, and US Inventor was formed in the big fight to stop the Innovation Act. Um, and we actually succeeded with, with some help eventually, but we were critically important in stopping that bill, our group, US Inventor. And so our purpose now is to, uh, number one, stop any further bad legislation, um, but more so right now, because we're, we're able to do that part. But the key thing now is to restore the rights of inventors that have been lost from the legislation that did pass. Um, you as an inventor, you should be able to invent something significant. And even if you hardly have any money at all behind you, uh, you should be able to stop even the most powerful corporations in the world from simply taking it. Uh, that's what our patent system is supposed to allow you to do. And, and we are at US Inventor are totally committed to restoring uh, those rights to you as an inventor with a, with a US patent. Um, and, but what we'll find from the uh, uh, panelists who are here today, uh, we have a system now where if you invent something significant and the big corporations wanna take it and they're intent on taking it, uh, it is virtually impossible to, to stop them. And we'll be talking uh, about that as we go today. And the, the purpose is to inform you and inform uh, a large number of, of people across America about how bad the system is and why we need to fix it. Well, thank you, Randy. Now I want to ask you about PTAB because we're gonna be talking a lot about PTAB today. Just to note that a lot of inventors don't know what that means. And I know when I initially got my patent, I had no clue, I'd never heard of the PTAB. So could you tell us what the PTAB is and why is it bad for inventors? So the PTAB is the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Um, this was created by that bill that did pass in 2011, the American Vents Act. It was sold to Congress as a cheaper, faster, uh, but fair way uh, to resolve patent disputes, specifically to resolve 
uh, as they were calling it, uh, the issuance of patents that shouldn't have been issued. Uh, it was supposed to be fair, it was supposed to be cheap, fast, et cetera. You know, it all sounded good and they, man, they sold it beautifully because you're talking about you know, teams of lobbyists with mountains of money to donate to campaigns, et cetera. And uh, they basically sold everybody on it. Both sides of the aisle uh, did assent. And this is a very bipartisan issue, but it's both sides on either side that uh, whether we're trying to get a bill passed for us or trying to, they're trying, bad guys trying to pass a bill against us. It's both sides, Democratic and Republican. Um, so um, basically, um, they created the PTAB. The PTAB is an easier way to invalidate a patent, and it doesn't have a jury. Previous to that, you would have an actual jury uh, and a real court with a lot of due process with a lifetime appointed judge. That's important. Uh, but what the PTAB does is it's an administrative court. There's not much due process. Um, there's no jury. You don't have a lifetime appointed judge. You have a panel of typically three, uh, they're called judges. They're basically attorneys who are government employees. And typically, you know, they're from corporations that uh, are on the wrong side of our issue very often. Um, and they have a kill rate of 84%. 84% of the time they, that they go, that a patent goes all the way through the process, it gets either fully or partially invalidated. And when I say partially, that's typically the claims that matter. So it basically gets neutered. Uh, this is all wrong. And uh, uh, the inventors that we'll talk today have been through that process, uh, including Josh, uh, Josh Malone, who's part of our group. Um, and they'll tell you what happened and it's horrendous. And this is one of the things we're fighting very hard to change. And actually we'll, we'll give you some information about a particular uh, effort we have underway right now that's very timely where you can actually help us uh, get the changes made that, that would significantly increase uh, or improve our rights. Thank you, Randy. Uh, I think that was a good summary of exactly what the PTAB is, but you're going to hear real life stories now and how uh, PTAB has really affected inventors' lives in a very negative, negative way. So our first panelist today is Jean Luoma. He's worked on a lot of inventions over the years and he's obtained a dozen patents. One particular invention of his actually went big time. Now, if any of your family members have long hair, like me, for example, you'll know all about clogged drains. Now, Gene came up with an easier, more effective way to unclog drains, which he named Zip It. Zip It was licensed to a company with thousands of stores and Gene was receiving significant royalties. Let's have a quick look at a little video. Zip It Drain Cleaning Tool, the amazingly fast, easy and inexpensive way to clear clogged and slow running drains. Use it on sinks, showers and bathtubs. Just zip it in, Zip it out. So simple, you might secretly enjoy using it. Don't believe me? This is one of the first ones that I felt had a good potential for sales. And I did manage to get into a Menards, a large big box store. We found a uh, company, Cobra Products. And their salesman had seen the zip it at Menards. They came to me and asked to license it. And he knew what the value of it and the volume they were selling of the zippets. But he went to work for a company called GT Water. He then manufactured a competitive drain cleaning, integrally molded with barbs and a handle, flexible for cleaning drains. The patent office is not protecting me. The patent I have is actually worthless. And this is the patent that I received from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And what is it worth? What did it do to protect me? Zero. As soon as somebody infringed on my, my product, the patent office threw out my patent. I've been fighting the patent and trademark office, the PTAB, for nine years, and I've spent over $400,000 in excess. I thought when you have a patent, it protects the product, the zip it. This patent did not protect our product. It's, to me, it's worthless. It's a, it's a worthless piece of paper that we spent thousands of dollars on. Well, you can see from the video, uh, Gene explains that the licensing agreement, um, the licensee actually agreed to help fight any companies who would dare to infringe on them. And everything really did look good. And as Gene explained, the top salesman for the licensee left the company and went to a competitor that, that immediately knocked off Gene's invention. Gene, thank you so much for being with us today and, and for sharing your story. And um, I, I, it makes me very upset when I hear stories like this. Can you, can you tell us what happened to you, please? 
thank you for what you're doing to the inventors and helping out. But yes, that's true. The um, product was knocked off by GT Water. And um, immediately after that happened, uh, the Culver Products, which is uh, now called Brasscraft, it's owned by Masco Corporation, which is a $10 billion a year company. And um, what they did is they filed a cease and desist. And when uh, Cobra then, I mean, GT Water turns around, files a re-exam of my patent. At that time, then uh, my uh, licensee said, we're not going to join you in this fight. You're on your own. And not only that, we're not going to pay your royalties. We'll put the royalties in escrow until you can um, actually prove that you do have a, a defendable patent. And I says, well, I do have a patent. It hasn't been invalidated. Finally, um, with some legal wrangling, I did get them to actually pay me royalties. But at the same time, they would not join me in the battle with the with the uh, with the uh, defense of the patent. So what happened is, is um, they at that time had uh, oversold probably 20 million uh, units already. And the um, the uh, PTAB then, which I didn't even know existed, this was back and then in 13, they took a look and they rejected all my claims based on a, a patent as a, that was actually cited in my patent by the previous USPTO examiners, they had overcome all the, re all the rejections to that. It was basically a steel, tempered steel coil. This was a 1906, a tempered steel. Uh, they said that this is prior art that my, my patent, uh, I could have easily, anybody easily in the art of designing could have figured this out. They said that the coil itself was the handle and the hole in the center of the coil was the actual aperture for putting your finger. So they they then turned around and um, eliminated all of my, uh, declined all my claims. What happened then is I kept uh, appealing it and we appealed it all the way to the, um, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And at that time, just when I was ready to file my uh, briefs, this Arthrex case came up and they said, hey, these judges are all, all appointed um, illegally. They weren't appointed properly and uh, they should have gone through, so, uh, through, the, through the president and through the Congress for appoint, appointments. What happened then is um, it ended up uh, going back and um, was sent back to the uh, to the court of appeals. They, they said the motion to vacate the decision of my my um, patent because of the Arthrex case. So right now, my patent has been kicked back, and it still sits in limbo, um, waiting for us for the uh, courts to make a decision on the judges. But as far as I'm concerned, the PTAB, the judges, what is their um, skills? Are they mechanical engineers, designers, chemical engineers? Who, what knowledge do they have in taking a hold of an inventor's idea and actually uh, de destroying it and taking away my livelihood and the income I was receiving off this patent prior from the time of 1906 until my patent was issued? There wasn't anything like it. If there was, I would have been using it, but there wasn't anything. So they just basically turned around um, and invalidated all of my claims. We've run into this uh, over and over that the, PAT, the PTAB judges uh, don't have nearly the qualifications of the examiners that grant the patents. And yours is another example. And another thing about your situation is they, they invalidated invalidated it as obvious based on the same prior art that the examiner had already looked at. In other words, the examiner looked at it, went through the whole process, and, and as you know, getting a patent is not an easy process, and it takes a long time, and, and the examiner looked at it, and they decided, okay, nope, yours is not obvious, and we grant you a patent, 
then the PTAB looks at it and says, yeah, we're looking at the same prior art the examiner looked at and we think it's obvious and they can invalidate on that basis. It, it's, it is outrageous. My patent attorney said that I had nothing to worry about and it was in 2011, but they weren't aware of even what was happening with, with what was coming up with, was a, with a PTAB. And they still didn't realize that uh, the battle that I was in to try to defend my patent. You know, they, the, the, when I was going through this infringement process, um, Cobra would not even allow me to use the 12, 13 million sales already that prove that of its, you know, it's not, it's not obvious. And they would not allow me. So I had to try to find a way to, to put something in the, in my appeal that, hey, there isn't anything like this out there. So I was not only fighting the PTAB, but I was also fighting my licensee that um, I had licensed the product too. They turn around then and says, well, Gene, because you can't defend your patent, we're gonna just manufacture our own. And they came and told me this, uh, we're gonna discontinue selling your zip it. We're gonna discontinue advertising it. We're just gonna switch our new product that we're having made offshore. I think it was in Taiwan and replace it with the zip it on the shelves. So my royalty, they were selling 200,000, 300,000 a month. From there it dropped to zero because they just switched over to their product. Even still, I had the agreement with them was still in effect because my patents claims were denied, but it hadn't gone, hadn't finished going through the invalidation process. But because of what the PTAB has done and allowed all these others to enter the market, you know, Drano, Clorox, um, Liquid Plumber, Roto Rooter, and all these, they were in the market now selling. I was cut off zero. There was the sales dropped to zero. Just for the for the viewers, um, I just want to point something out that Gene has just said. So the licensee uh, in the licensing agreement said that uh, they would help Gene defend against infringement. Now the wording of it uh, is maybe what they ended up falling back on and going against. But so they said they'd help you defend against patent infringement. And when it came down to it, um, there was a point of time where uh, one, one of the defenses against uh, the, the, argue, the uh, allegation that it's obvious is, is it commercially successful? If it's commercial, if it's never been, if it hasn't been done and it's commercially successful, that helps you argue that it was not obvious and therefore the patent is valid. And of course, the, the key data there was all their sales, which were huge. But because they were now at odds with Gene and didn't want to pay him his royalties, they would not provide that data to the court. So the data that would have helped Gene win the case on, and I, I'm not sure if he would have won it because the PTAB, as we know, uh, there are a lot of problems there, but at least this was a, a good effort in the fight to win the case. And the, the licensee who had actually signed a contract saying that they would help fight these types of cases withheld that information and were at total odds with Gene and he was having to fight against them as well as the PTAB. This is outrageous. And uh, I would say that one of the things any of you should do, you know, one of the one of the things that people say as well, if you license it to a big company, they'll help protect you and you're in good shape. Well, no, you better you better have a very sharp attorney draw up the language of that agreement in such a way that they can't figure out a way with their own attorneys to back out of it. And even then, I, I, I don't know if if that'll help you as much as it should. The key is we have to restore the system and make it so that the PTAB is either fair or that we don't have to uh, be part of it. I'd like to ask you, Jim, what was the personal impact on you and your family and your health and your well-being? You know, I don't talk about it much, but I have muscular dystrophy along with, along with two of my three children. And um, I was using this money. Of course, I'm an inventor and I'm doing it so I can make a living. This is what I do. And it impacted me to a point where, you know, I was unable to uh, provide any assistance to my family and to, to help them maintain a, um, a livelihood that's keeping them from going on government assistance. But it totally shut me off. And one other thing I wanted to say is that Cobra um, also then filed a 
patent uh, uh, filed a claim against me. They wanted to claw back all the royalties they had paid me had not had a defendable patent. I mean, you could argue that just about any patent out there is not defendable in the current system. I mean, very few, if any, are could be argued to be actually defendable. Jean, I'd like to thank you for joining um, and sharing your story. And just just a quick quick ask, um, how much time and money um, did you actually spend fighting for your patent? It's been many years. It's since 2011, of course, that we kept appealing and they went on. Well, I've spent just not only the money, which is over $400,000, but all the time and the expense to go to the court trials and, and with the attorneys and just taking me and uh, taking me away from my, my love in my life is, um, is patenting and working on other inventions. And the inventor is the heartblood of the uh, economy in the country. We are behind you. And we want to see more of your inventions coming out really soon so that we can share them with everyone. So stick around for a bit because we have some questions at the end uh, and I'm sure some people have for you. So I just want to quickly introduce uh, Josh Malone. Many of you have heard of Josh, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me introduce you. He is our resident expert. Now, Josh quit his uh, corporate job in 2006 to take his shot at the inventor's dream. Eight years later, savings depleted and kids college unfunded, he took one last swing before drudging back to the corporate world. And he hit a home run with a bunch of balloons. His solution to the 63 year old problem of filling and sealing water balloons instantly became the number one selling toy. But because it was so successful, his invention was stolen by a notorious serial infringer who convinced the USPTO to revoke his patent under a controversial procedure of the 2011 American Invents Act. So a brutal and costly legal battle combined with an anti-corruption crusade ultimately resulted in a $31 million award and thankfully the restoration of his patent rights. Now, Josh is a full-time volunteer with US Inventor, and we'll be hearing more from Josh soon, but thank you for joining us, Josh. It's nice to see you here today. So I want to introduce you now to our next panelist, uh, Bill O'Keefe. Now, Bill was a mechanical contractor until he took over his father's architectural glazing company. One particular area he innovated in is fire safety glass. Now, under the intense heat of fire, glass will crack. It creates an opening for the fire to get through. So a solution for this cracking is the wire mesh that you frequently see inside of some glass. But the wire mesh, did you know, causes the glass to break more easily under impact, which actually is very dangerous. The needed solution was glass that wouldn't shatter from fire, but would also stand up to greater impacts. Let's have a quick look at a little video. The large companies in this industry said it couldn't be done, but Bill solved the problem. Bill, how did you solve that problem? And what happened when those companies copied your invention? My story goes back a little. I got involved in the fire glass business back in uh, the early 80s. I patented um, a wire glass with a film. And, uh, even after all these meetings, they said it couldn't be done or whatever, so I patented it, and I got a patent on the wire glass of the film. Well, it wasn't long before the industry was producing was producing wire glass with film on it. This is Pilkington and the others because they wanted to keep their market, and I was buying mine from uh, from uh, other manufacturers. So I sued them uh, under the patent 
almost for infringement of my patent. And that was a, that was the start of a million dollars worth of lawsuit because I wound up they sued me back for uh, Lanham Act violations or whatever unfair co competition. I sued them back for Lanham Act, and little by little, in the meantime, they took had their lawyers go and they had me go to the, the uh, they had my patent uh, invalidated, and uh, so then I went to the PTAB and. I had the same uh, uh, thing happen to me. Well, there's a little more to it. At that time, I also went to the testing labs because they, they had not tested theirs. They just used my eye. I said, well, how do you know theirs works the same as mine? It's fire rated and there's this. And I got in a fight with the testing labs. They, so it was a fight. It seems like I love fights, <laughs> which I don't. But uh, anyway, so they were selling theirs against mine and, and they, they got my patent decertified. So I never got a dime for it. All I, all I will say is that I did make the world safer because all glass now that has, is used indoors or in, in, next to the door has to meet that. I even got the, co I got the code change so that all doors and all glass and areas where kids can be imp impacted or people can impact the glass uh, easily have to be safety rated, uh, so they have to have a film on. Bill, the the background is fascinating because obviously it takes a lot to of time and money to develop that. But um, did these um, infringers actually copy directly your invention? Yeah, well, as far as yes, it had to it had to be the same film, and which is really was the invention was coming up with a film that would not burn. And that took me, I don't know, I did, I did a little over a year for the testing of different films to find a film, most of them burn. In fact, they, when they burn, they burn more, bigger than the fire. As soon as they get on fire, they, they light up like a Christmas tree because most of them are petroleum based. So you had to find a film that would, would be a strong and protect from going through it. But at the same time, when, when a fire affected one side, they would melt off the other they would maybe burp, fall off this side or melt off this side. So yes, it was direct. Obviously you've contributed, you've contributed tons of important technology to, to this industry. And it's, it's obviously been a benefit to society. Let me fill the audience in because that's one of our themes here deals with the PTAB, this invalidation procedure, and you don't have to talk about it, but basically they took another technology of yours, which you didn't cover here, and uh, the patent office issued you a patent on it. And then right. when you went to, to ask these infringers to stop or pay you, they went to the patent office. The patent office has now invalidated that patent. I want to read from the decision for the audience because um, it's important to understand what's going on here. Um, here's a couple of quotes from the decision on this adjustable module floor plate that's another uh, obviously a very useful invention because it's, it, it also is copied and in litigation. The quote is, when a patent simply arranges old elements with each performing the same functions, the same function it had been known to perform and yields no more than one would expect from such an arrangement, the combination is obvious. Based on our review of the evidence of record, we are persuaded that the petition demonstrates by a preponderance of the evidence that claim four would have been unpatentable as obvious over the combined teachings of Ray and DE 759. Um, so just for the audience, it's a little bit of technical term. Basically what they say at the PTAB is, especially for an invention like mine or like uh, Bill's, they're basically saying those nuts and bolts and glass and, and screws and threads all existed before and you were the first one to put them together, but that was obvious. And then they said, we are persuaded it would have been obvious. And that's the gist of almost all these decisions at the PTAB, where the patent office recently said that is an invention and it's not obvious. Their colleagues down the hall come back and say, we don't agree. We agree with the infringer. It would have been obvious to combine these things together again. Um, you feel free to comment on that, but is my assessment largely uh, uh, what happened in your case of the adjustable uh, glass modules? 
we make, you're talking about an adjustable thing for a glass floor. We make a glass floor. And in it, we make it as a, in a way that has not been ever sold or made before, because a glass floor is a relatively new thing, okay? We make it as one panel, one unit. And it took uh, four years of testing and whatever to find a floor panel that we could get that would go because we had to develop with the uh, foundations also and everything that would go for two hours. I mean, that means they have the fire coming from underneath it for two hours and the glass floor has to be in, in hold up a hundred pounds per square foot during that two hour time. So our glass floor is a, a one unit. They had a patent on a glass floor where they put glass down first, their fire glass down first. Then they put a, a bar in on a steel plate on the side. They bolted this bar through one, uh, on this side. So they had the glass underneath, the bar here, and then they would put their top piece of glass on top. So that means you had to install the floor in two, two separate operations. One, you put the fire glass down, then you put these bars in, and then you put another layer on top. And they call that a, 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 a load bypass device. And that's what they, that's what they uh, patented. Would you say that these uh, administrative judges that decided your patent was obvious, did they understand the differences in your invention and, and this one you just described? No, that's exactly right. Uh, I read it. I couldn't believe the, the decision. Uh, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the, what's behind it. They don't know the testing that's involved to get something to pass. They know nothing about fire testing. They know nothing about the technical aspects of what you're presenting them. So they're making a decision on whatever end. I think a lot of times they're influenced by the law firms that are handling it, that are located, back, that they have offices big enough to have big offices and, and, uh, and uh, lobbyists for those offices back in Washington. And some of those, off, that's why I think it's an 86% failure rate. I think that the, any, any major law office has somebody back there uh, that's influencing them on their side. You address several of our myths, um, especially the one that, that the PTAB is made up of ex technical experts, and that's helpful to hear from a real inventor, your point of view on that. I'll pass it back to Natasha now. Thank you, Bill. I mean, the, the story is obvious here. We hear big corporations taking advantage of independent inventors and then using the PTAB and the APJs, their administrative patent judges, who are not trained in the technical nature of each pattern that they're examining. So there must be something we can do about it. And this is where we come to our give inventors a chance. Josh and Randy, what is this about? Is this an opportunity for us as inventors to let the USPT know, USPTO know how the PTAB should be run? Yeah, ab absolutely, Natasha. We have a real opportunity right now um, Josh, do you want to introduce it? These stories have been going on for a long time, right? I, I hit it. I hit the wall hard in, in 2016 and I came and met uh, Randy in, in Washington and at the patent office. And we began the effort, I would say then, because they were working on a lot of other problems in the patent system until I, I joined back then. We, we raised the attention to the abuse of the PTAB. This 84% number that's on Randy's background now is just outrageous. And it's not because they're making that many mistakes. And so the PTAB was supposed to be a faster, cheaper alternative to district court. Now I'll tell you what, that's exactly what I want as an inventor. You know, if, if someone thinks I don't, I don't deserve my patent, then bring it on. <laughs> Go ahead, show me, show me how I don't deserve my patent. But that's clearly not what's been going on at the PTAB for eight years. It's absolutely been used to harass, um, double jeopardy for inventors, uh, interfering with jury trials. Um, it's just been completely abused. It's almost always a, a Fortune 100 or a Fortune 10 corporation on one side and some entrepreneur or solo inventor on the other side. And so that is explicitly not what it was supposed to be. 
And, and after, as a result of our effort the last three years, um, the, op, the patent office has been listening and the director of the patent office has, has issued a request for comments. And this is a formal process. There's gonna be formal uh, notice and comment rulemaking that, that will establish the reg, regulations in the federal register that will determine how the PTAB is supposed to be run. Finally, for the first time. Uh, but that means that actual inventors, business owners, actual experts like Bill and others have to weigh in and comment on this process because your comments will form the regulations next year. And so uh, we've set it up and uh, Natasha can show you guys how to participate, but this has been a long time coming and a lot of destructions that already happened. But I tell you what, there's a lot more to come and we can recover from this. And it's set up now. We're basically at the goal line and we're gonna push across the goal line by filing our comments in the coming days. One quick thing, and it's very important that we really comment uh, that, that many, many, many of us out here uh, do comment because the other side will be commenting as well. Our enemies will be commenting because they wanna keep the system broken. Uh, so we need to have a lot of us, a lot of legitimate uh, people, which we all are, uh, don't know about the other side, they're gonna find whoever they can to comment, but we, we need to get in there and really show that we care about this and that we're a massive group, which we are. Well, thank you, Randy and Josh, and we'll go back to you in a second. But this is where everyone out there, every single inventor, this is how you can play your part and you can do something today that will only take two minutes and can impact inventors' lives for many years to come. So here goes, are you ready? Let's go to usinventor.org slash PTAB comments. Now, if we pull that up, we have a wizard which will make your life really easy to submit comments. We'll go to the comment area and you put your phone number in, you get a verification code, which you hit verify. Then you have to put some personal information, your name, your address, your city, your email. And then you scroll to the bottom and you hit next. So far, so good. Then you have a little comment here, an example. You can change it according to your situation then hit next. And then you see this big statement in there. You can change any part of it. You can delete it all, but we've made it easy for you. It's in there ready for you, hit finish. And then when you do that, your comment will be available for us to submit on your behalf to the USPTO. So the director at the USPTO will be able to read those comments and that will help him create rulemaking perhaps that will help inventors for years to come. Randy and Josh, do you want to add a little bit more to that? I, I think it's really clear, but I just want to emphasize this isn't a comment like a survey, like I like your service. This is an actual law, basically uh, not a law, but a regulation. So this is a formal official part of the process. And so you're not just saying complaining. Um, you're not just registering this. They actually have to listen and respond to your suggestions on how to run the PTAP. <laughs> and the site that Natasha just shared, we have uh, a, sta a statement of what those rules should be. So if you, uh, if you think that we're on the right track, uh, just file those comments. If you uh, take some time to read the background information that's there and, and, and ensure that you agree with it. Uh, basically we've said, here's, and here's the other important thing to think about. Um, we can't change the law that's done through Congress. And so we've scoped these comments and these responses to things that the patent office actually can do under the law. So we've, it's not everything we want, but it's about 80% of what we need to level the playing field. And these are things that the patent office can do and that they almost have to do if we do a good job here in supporting uh, these regulations. Regardless of, of who, uh, regardless of the outcome of this election, uh, these comments will be filed and will be part of the formal uh, process of, of, of regulating the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Okay, perfect. So I'll emphasize again, usinventor.org slash PTAB comments. Go in there, watch the videos, read what we've put in there, write your own comments, or just use our wizard. It takes less than two minutes, as you saw just then, and your comments can make a difference for future uh, inventors. All right, so I always want to take in questions and I haven't seen many pop up today, but this one here is interesting from Brad. 
I was not aware of USI when I started my patent process. The inventor club and the patent lawyer did not mention USI at all. Why aren't people aware of your efforts? Josh and Randy. There's all kinds of distractions out there. A um, lot, lot of uh, things attract, you know, vying for people's attention. Um, I think we've gotten out pretty good, but you know what? Um, you, you, te I, to anyone who has found us, tell all your friends about us. Tell everybody you know about us. Tell all the inventors you know. Tell your club. Get them involved if we're not already with them, which we, we should be. I, I'll get with you later and find out who that club is because <laughs> I've I'm, I'm been talking to every club that I know of. Um, hey, Randy, I have a comment because I was yeah. there, right? When I was just launching a bunch of balloons, I wasn't listening to you guys. I had a business <laughs> to run. I was busy. This doesn't affect me. Um, I'm going to hire a good attorney and I don't have time to worry about that. And I will say when I started, I would say that 99% of inventors uh, in 2014, when, when I started uh, this last journey, 99% of inventors didn't know the patent office could, could take back your patent after they issued it. Um, today, I think um, that number is down. I think maybe 80% of inventors don't know that, which means you know, we've, uh, we, we've increased our messaging and, and we're getting the word out. It's not everywhere yet, but we are definitely making strides and getting the word out. This program is part of that. Getting people like Brad and others, and Brad, Brad's response is encouraging because he's not ignoring it. He's saying, oh, this could affect me. And more and more people are doing that. And so um, we're not crying wolf here. This is serious stuff, as Bill and Gene can tell you. And hundreds of other inventors and um, we're, we're coming along, but th thanks for the, thanks for, thanks for engaging. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're totally committed to this fight. I mean, we have been and continue to be, and doesn't matter who gets elected. Uh, uh, we, we are fighting the fight and uh, we intend to pull it off. And actually this comment, this comment uh, rulemaking is a key part of this effort right now. It's very timely. Um, Bill and, and Jean, is there anything you would like to add? Let's let's start with Jean, dropping you in there. Well, the the thing is, more people have to be aware of what ha what's happening with the PTAB, because they don't have the expertise in every application. You know, I think they're skilled in the art of maybe some word art, but as far as coming up with decision on a, on a mechanical or a chemical or a physical device. Um, they're individuals walking around with a leather briefcase and their shiny shoes, and they have no idea how they're impacting an inventor's life by destroying the income that they're making because we're basically professional inventors. And we go through the process of spending all the money and all the time and effort to get the patent. And then it's so easy for them just to come along. It doesn't seem like it bothers them that they just invalidate it for some um, reason they don't even understand. And uh, I'd just like to ask Bill, quick comment. What do you feel? Just to add that uh, I didn't clarify uh, Josh's uh, after he read what, what the other patent that I'm involved in. It's, I have, I have, I, they were issued a patent and the company that's um, having a fight with now uh, with, and then my patent was invalidated by, they had a patent and I, then I got this patent uh, uh, years later and they invent, they had all of the information because the other company had a patent. They issued me a patent and Mine's totally different, I believe, but anyway, well, that'll wind up in court. But now I'm having to spend a million dollars because they, I have a patent and they have a patent. There's, they, they don't protect you at all. It's not like I can go back to them and say, hey, look, you issued me a patent. It's not my fault I went out and used my patent. You looked at it, you, you said it was perfect and that I could use it, that it was a patentable item. I went and used it. And now I'm getting sued by them saying I'm infringing on their patent that's 15 years old, that you had for 15 years. There ought to be almost part of the law is that they, you can't, if, if you both have patents, you can't fight each other, you know? So 
or else it's the pat or the patent office has to, has to has to protect you. I mean, there ought to be some protection. If I had a patent issued to me, and that's the, what I was using, and it's cost me a million dollars, and in the process they they decertified or they invalidated my patent. Bill, I think you raised some great points there, and I felt my heart flutter when you said a million dollars. I don't have a million dollars. I don't think many inventors do. So I think we made some excellent points there today. And I just want to thank US Inventor for the hard work they do to Josh, to Randy, to Paul, to many others behind the scenes. You really are making an impact and helping inventors. And I'd like to thank Jean and Bill for sharing their heartfelt stories, the, the difficulties they face. These are real world, real world people, real world inventors fighting to stay alive. And I'd like to thank all of you, all the inventors who've tuned in today. And I want you to share this message with all your inventor friends and all your would-be inventor friends, because together we can make a difference. And don't forget to check out usinventor.org. There's plenty of resources there and the video that you've seen today will be there later. So I'm going to hand you for a last word to Randy. So I wanna thank all the panelists for participating today um, and also all the viewers. Uh, thank you for watching. This is the restoration of the rights of inventors in America is so important to this country. Uh, it, 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 is, it is outrageous uh, that we have lost these rights. This is something we've had for 200 years that allowed America to lead the world in innovation. Uh, that, that we would let multinational corporations destroy these rights of Americans, of, of a key part of America, is, is just unthinkable. And, and the, the, the restoration of these rights is so important. Please get the word out far and wide. We need to grow our ranks. We need more people aware of this. Everybody I talk to becomes interested in this issue. Uh, and right now, we have a real opportunity to get the PTAB uh, reined in and altered and changed and have rules made there that will, uh, that could, if we, if we really push it and get enough comments in and get enough support for what we're doing, we could get rules made there uh, that would actually make the PTAB fair. Uh, and so please go to our website, uh, go to the link that Natasha showed, uh, which will be shown below as well, uh, and get involved and take a look at what we've got there. This is, this is a set of rules that uh, would make a huge difference, okay? Thank you for your support. And um, I'm glad to have all of you as a part of this fight uh, thank you for being in the trenches with us.